Hello, this is Robert Bell from the Intelligent Community Forum, and welcome to another episode of the Intelligent Community Podcast. We're talking today about innovation, one of the six factors that make up the ICF method. Now, there are two aspects to innovation in communities that are working to build inclusive prosperity in this period of digital transformation. On the one hand, intelligent communities work to encourage private sector innovation because, well, it creates employment and wealth. They bring together the stakeholders who make that happen, uh, not just business, business, of course, but not just business, higher education, healthcare, nonprofits, government at the table as well, to form a self-sustaining ecosystem that supports existing businesses and gives rise to new ones. Now, on the other hand, they also innovate in the processes of government and how it delivers services. They work to make government run better, faster, and cheaper, which also signals to innovative people and organizations that they have a natural home in that community. I'm speaking today with Joel Karnas, the president and CEO of the nonprofit Alliance for Innovation, which ICF is proud to have as a partner organization. This association inspires innovation in local government and connects a network of leaders across North America. If you've ever attended their Transforming Local Government Conference, you know that they and their members are experts at identifying best practices and building cultures of innovation within the walls of local government. Over a 20 year career so far, Joel has been a management consultant for KPMG, a strategist for Walt Disney, an operations director of a major video game company and of the X Prize, which is the world leader in using open innovation competitions to address big challenges. Joel, welcome to the program. Thanks Robert, it's a pleasure to be here. Innovation is right there in the name of your organization, the Alliance for yeah. Innovation. So how do you define it and why is it important for local government? You know, it's funny, that word, we get really wrapped around it. It's become almost a nonsense word, uh, ironically. The Alliance for Innovation is 40 years old, and in 1979, innovation meant this adoption of new technology and kind of driving to this, this future. Now innovation is everything from, you know, just like putting sesame seeds on your avocado toast, right? There's, there's an innovation. Um, so it, the word has lost some of its charge, so to me, I'm, I'm really keen, I, I key in on the effect that an innovation is a significant positive change. Right? That, that's, that's the, it's the result. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, we have also really wrapped arms around a new word, anti-fragile. And anti-fragile is the ability of an organization to grow stronger under stress. So when you combine growing stronger under stress with resulting in a significant positive change, then you've got the transformation in local government that we're looking for. Interesting, and of course, when you say anti-fragile, you're, I think, going a step beyond what people would normally talk about, which is resilience, right? Exactly. Yeah. In, in resilience, you're looking to spring back and to kind of come back to your original shape after being put under stress. In anti-fragile, you're looking to spring forward and to exceed your original shape after being put under stress. Yeah. One of the questions we get a lot at the forum is a, is a very simple and difficult one to answer, which is how do I get started? Um, in your experience, how does a mayor, a member of council, an administrative leader get that ball rolling when it comes to becoming um, more innovative and becoming less fragile? You might, you might think it's around, well, go get some funding or, or come up with the perfect plan. It's, it's more complicated and more simple than that. It's aspire to greatness, right? If you truly aspire to greatness, aspire to positive change, aspire to anti-fragility and invite others to share in that vision, then you have to move one step beyond that and make room for others to contribute to that vision. Yeah, they can't just share in your vision, they have to contribute to creating, to co-creating a vision of the future. With that vision in place, the rest is blocking and tackling. There's millions of books around Agile, Lean, Six Sigma, this, that, whatever. Uh, it, there's process is, is fine. You have to have the desire because this is hard. And it's hard, not because of technology, not because it's hard to do systems implementations or whatever. Those things are hard too. It's hard because it's, it hurts, like going to the gym, right? It's, it's uncomfortable. And so the way you get started is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's a great uh, description. And yes, you're right. It's 
uh, that's pretty much the advice that we give. It's it, you got to start with with the folks, and the folks have got to find a way to live with the chaos that you're about to create. That's really interesting. <laughs> well, now creating so you already said it. Creating something's never easy. It's never a straight path. So what? Aside from you know inspiration, aside from the the willingness and ability to embrace change, what are the biggest and most common barriers to innovation in local government? Part of it is the hero complex, where a, a mayor or a strong leader will come in and want to be an innovation driver, and they are able to rally people behind them for a certain amount of time and maybe get something accomplished, maybe not. But either way, it's attached to that person. It's not attached to the community, and it's not bubbling up from the ground up. So a, a innovator it doesn't need to be Steve Jobs or Thomas Edison, they don't need to be a genius, they need to be a gardener. And they need to cultivate fields that will allow everyone to grow up and create an, you, you talked about it at the very beginning, this innovation ecosystem is what you need to create. So it's about finding partnerships, building relationships and putting the pieces in place for a self-sustaining, in fact, not just self-sustaining, but anti-fragile system to take place where the more activity it has, the bigger and stronger it gets. That's interesting because that's exactly you know what I was talking about in, when I did the introduction was about how you do this in the private sector, and it's fascinating to me that that you're basically laying out the same roadmap for public sector innovation, which is no surprise. I mean, it's these are human beings in both cases that we're dealing with, yeah. and you have to help them forward. Um, in our most recent book, which is from connectivity to community, I wrote that uh, as much as we might just absolutely hate it, an obstacle is an invitation to innovate. So, you know, this is a big, big barrier, the hero complex, the unwillingness to embrace change. How have you seen communities in your network you know, overcome that? There, it, it's not a straight path, right? You, you, may, you may have multiple attempts at this. Like, oh, we had an innovation team in the past. We tried that. We tried this lean thing. We tried daily scrums. We tried this and that. The, the idea is to keep chipping away at it and that each of these, even if the innovation team spins up and comes down, that is not a failure. That is an incremental step, right? You've, you've, you've introduced vocabulary. You've built muscles. You've introduced concepts to people. And the more you can do this, the stronger it's going to be. Um, I learned a lesson about this a, a long time ago working at the XPRIZE Foundation. We had a prize that we considered to be a failure. It was a, a, to create a, a, a car that got 100 miles per gallon. Uh, the XPRIZE actually worked, right? So this car worked. Um, and they created a car that made a, got 102 miles per gallon with regular parts. You could, you could build this in your garage. It was built in a garage. Um, so why aren't we all driving cars that get 100 miles per gallon? Right? There was, there's a lot of systemic issues at play beyond the technology of building a 100 mile per gallon car. And so the, the prize succeeded, but it failed because it didn't create the systemic change that they were hoping for, except that it did. And we didn't realize it until I dug into it 10 years later. And I was calling some of the people that participated in the prize and asking them about their lives and what had happened. And, and wouldn't you know, it's like, Oh yeah, I'm working at Tesla now. Oh, I'm, I'm working at Tesla. Oh, I'm, I'm a VP at Tesla. These people had all come together around a vision of a better car. And they had started to work together from across the country and in different teams working against each other, competing, but in a friendly environment that then when the chips fell into place, when a must comes there, when the funding is there, when the time is right, now there is capacity in the system to actually advance that ball. So all of these things, advancing your innovation ecosystem, you have to play the long game. You have to just kind of keep building capacity, building capacity, building capacity, and you'll have wins, you'll have losses, but then you'll, you'll look back and go, oh, that's how we got here because we tried this other thing that didn't even work, but now we have a, a nexus of people who know each other, are connected, and are ready to take on the next challenge. One of our more successful examples of a rural community uh, is, is in Mitchell, South Dakota. And their moment, the moment that made them was when they uh, developed a big plan to build a fiber network for the community, fiber to the home, you know, and, and, and the voters voted it down. 
Mm. And so, you know, in shock and horror, the mayor and council had put so much effort into this, stepped back and didn't do anything about it for a while, but it stimulated other forces. In, 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 to, you know, echo what you just said, it stimulated other things which began to bring it about. And of course, they've got one of those now as well as a great deal else. Um, so that's, I mean, that was a success story for us. Out of all the innovation success stories that you've been exposed to, what, what are one or two that really stand out? Well, you mentioned fiber. Um, one that one that stands out to me is Fort Collins uh, fiber journey. Right? So uh, Darren Atterbury, the, the manager in Fort Collins, he's talking to the, the broadband providers in the, in the area saying, when are we going to get gig speeds uh, to Fort Collins? And they looked at him and said, you're not. This is not on our strategic plan. We are not delivering that to you. And he refused to accept that, right? He's just like, no, that's, that's not the right answer. So then he went through this whole program of, of starting with aspiration. We aspire to be a connected community, right? We want gig speed. We want, to, we want access for everybody. Now, this is a big thing too, not just providing it to the wealthy families who can pay $500 a month, but every single household and business in the community. So then he asked for help. That's what innovators do. They realize they're not doing it. They reach out. So he, in this case, Darren is a member of the Alliance. He activated the Alliance community, was able to find people in Tennessee and in, in, in Oregon who had gone through similar journeys, created a plan, brought his bond measure out to the public, got it approved this time, uh, and was able to build up a community broadband facility. And then this gets into the, the add-on benefits. Yes, they're digging the cable, they're, they're laying, the, laying the, the gig speed to every single household in the, in the community at affordable prices. But they also have now this startup operating within City Hall. They have this whole business that has its own call center, its own billing operations, all these things that's operating in a 21st century business model informing this 150 year old town and vice versa. The, the people in City Hall have to inform that, well, that's nice, but that, you know, we have a culture here and you need to adhere to that. But there's a really nice give and take. And, and I think Darren will tell you one of, the, one of the things he's most pleased with is not just the, the delivery of the system, but now his entire raised level of capacity of his entire organization. They think differently, they talk differently, they aspire to different things down to the different processes and embracing those daily scrum meetings and stuff like that. It's been a win-win-win that just kind of continues to trail on. Right, and we preach a lot about, you know, achieve small victories because each victory makes you stronger. Each victory gives you that, that lift. Um, that's a great story. I, my favorite part about actually Fort Collins is their, uh, their campaign, their public awareness campaign, which is called Broadband and Beer. <laughs> and they, they would get people to meet in the pubs and talk about this in groups of five or six. I mean, you couldn't get more community organized than that. Exactly. Okay, what about the failures? I mean, there's a lot to learn from flaming out. You've positioned failure as being a necessary step on the road, which I certainly agree with. But are there examples in your mind that stick out and what, what innovators learned from them? Um, you know, there's there are many. Again, it's hard to, you have to use this this kind of, project failure versus aspirational failure, hmm, right? Yeah. Um, but the one we already touched on is many, many programs die when the leader leaves. So that's a failure of vision, that's a failure of leadership. And that, that's on, on, on the leader to, to create systems that aren't leader dependent. Right. And I've seen that over and over again, but even in our own organization, we try to innovate on a, on a constant basis. We've had a, a product available for uh, over a decade, the Innovation Academy. And this is a very well-received product, people love it, but it had problems with it in that we required a cohort of people to come and join. And so if you wanted to join the Innovation Academy, you had to wait for six other cities to join, you all had to go through together at the same speed, and you got a lot of value out at the end, but it was a lot of investment and people couldn't do it. Like, well, I can't wait, or my budget's not gonna work, or I lost that team member. And like a lot of stars had to align in order to make that work. So we created a new model and we parsed it out into this kind of menu of services and worked with a dozen partners to create this new Next Gen Innovation Academy. And we wanted to have this white glove service around it where we would lead the member communities through and, and introduce them to the different service providers and create a, a curriculum 
that would work for them. Aspirationally, this was great. Business model wise, it was a complete disaster. Right? It cost us more money to deliver than we were able to, to charge. So every time we ran someone through, it was a net loss for the organization. So that's, that is not a sustainable model. No, you, you can't make that up on the volume, as they say. Yeah. No, that, that, yeah, exactly. It's like, please stop. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we had to go back to the drawing board again and take off the white gloves, unfortunately, and now make it more of a self-service deal. It's more of a buffet where you walk up and you kind of serve yourself and you, you still have the options, but you don't have that wraparound service. Now it becomes more viable, but it was only one failure leading to another questions, leading to another failure, leading to other questions, and this kind of embrace of the failure and looking for those nuggets within it. It's like, okay, yeah, that clearly does not work, right. but that doesn't mean that 100% it doesn't work. It means some element of it doesn't work. We're, you're just constantly fiddling with the elements and as, always assuming that it will, in the future, also not work, right? We all we don't know, we know for a fact every program will fail. The only thing we don't know is how long it will take to fail. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I always think of that as you know, when you face that, you think you know, I was thought I was listening to the market, and I wasn't listening. I wasn't listening the right way. I wasn't really hearing what you really, really, really needed, which is the foundation of all innovation, of course. Yeah. Now, just to get topical for a moment, COVID nineteen, which of course is just a moving disaster here in the United States. Um, has placed a huge burden on municipal government. Um, and in back in, in from March to June, we actually did a podcast series about it called No Place But Home, where we were asking government leaders, you know, how are you managing? Um, looking at the, the broad scope of your of your members, do you think the pandemic has been an unwelcome, an unwelcome driver of innovation, mm -hmm. but nonetheless one that has is going to have positive long-term impacts? Or for most governments, has it sort of caused them to hunker down and just, you know, just we got to get through this and wait for the storm to pass? Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and uh, in ways that you might expect and, and might not expect. Um, in a standard bell curve way, we had our, our leaders, our early adopters, and they were already tinkering around with virtualizing city hall and already experimenting with distributed teams. And for them, this was just a moment to turn up the, the gas. Uh, on the other side, there's the hunker and bunker. There's close your eyes, slash 10% of your budget across the board, don't even ask questions, and just wait for the storm to pass. Um, now, where there's room to really work for both of our organizations is in this, this mass in the middle, this movable middle. And to, to use the inspiration of the leaders um, in order to, to move that, that curve a little to the left. And I'll tell you, one thing that has done that is the equity and inclusion movement and Black Lives Matter protests. It wasn't just the pandemic. Uh, it is this front and center awareness that anti-racism needs to be the charge in city hall right? that it, that it is not okay to this is this is definitely a place where resiliency is not okay it's not okay to go back to how we were before and you have to move forward and so this this combination of the the, the requirements of covid and just dealing with that rethinking our services, rethinking our relationships to our employees, and then the equity and inclusion demands of our community, making us rethink the world outside of City Hall, have really created this Overton window of opportunity, and it's wide. Uh, it, it is really wide, where we are working with members to launch an entirely new police force. And what does that mean? What does it mean to build a police force from the ground up in 2021, what are your goals? What is this? What does your staffing plan look like? How do you relate to to existing unions? How do you create new job descriptions? How do you relate to mental health and and systemic health and systemic violence? Um, there are so many wonderful questions being asked now because of the challenges of of 2020. Um, no one would would wish for it, but my lived experience is that we will come out stronger and better and a more just, equitable and highly functioning 
society. And it's not a straight line and it's not gonna be painless, uh, but I remain really optimistic uh, about the opportunities ahead of us. Well, that's, if you're like me, you, you go, you're optimistic one day and the next day you're thrown into the depths of despair. But yeah, it's, it was interesting. This year I got to visit virtually the city of Tallinn, which was our intelligent community of the year. And mm. I, when, of course, we talked about COVID, you know, and, and this is a place that's been building um, what they call e-services, you know, government, e-government things yeah. for a couple of decades. They've got like 600 of them and they do everything. And so what they basically said was, well, all the students were already online and all the schools were already online and all the people were already online. So really aside from, you know, having to close our restaurants for a little while, there wasn't much impact. I'm just looking at them thinking, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The leaders that can is, really blow you away. <laughs> it's amazing. It is amazing. Well, and, and honestly, it's a, it, it is a tale of two different experiences in local government too. There are, we talk about the the folks who are who are devastated, there are communities that are that are seeing record revenues, right? That because of just the way they're they're set up, and, and if it's around the grocery store or whatever, they're actually you know seeing surpluses. Yeah. And so we have to not just paint everybody with one brush, but understand the the specific issues at play in specific communities. Well, I think anybody who's been listening to this knows the Alliance for Innovation is doing some pretty pretty important work. Um, your next and newest event, however, is coming up in March, um, I think. Can you tell us about that? We got we got a little thing coming up. Uh, it's called Govapalooza. Uh, I just did a presentation this morning called What the Bleep is Govapalooza? <laughs> and the, we, I mean, we talked about it already, Robert. We, we are in a winter right now, right? In a, in a real winter and in a, in a kind of metaphorical winter. This is a, a deep, dark place for a lot of local governments. Uh, the, the demand for services has never been higher. The resource availability has never been lower for many local governments. There is a huge yawning chasm that people as organizations and as individuals are having to address. So Govapalooza is a celebration of everything great about local government. It's highlighting all the innovations, all the breakthroughs, all the anti-fragile stories, all those last miles of fiber going to someone's house, all the times when someone was able to build a coalition and really build systemic change with university partners, with nonprofits, with the private sector, transform city hall and create next generation services. We brought together dozens of partners, partners like ICF, partners like state associations, municipal leagues, uh, nonprofit organizations, universities, all coming together in a kind of south by southwest of local government, this, this festival atmosphere to just celebrate what's going right, inspire, inform, and supercharge the people on to the, into the next year. Uh, we'll be doing fireside chats with folks like Steve Wozniak is gonna drop by and talk about not only the past, about what it was like to, to invent Apple, but the, the current state of affairs with artificial intelligence and the future. What is the future of local government? What, what kind of society are we, are we trying to build? We'll meet with ocean explorers, with leading academics, uh, and of course with practitioners. And it's all, that's what it's really all about, where the rubber beats the road is who's doing it? Who's doing it great? How can we work with them? How can we copy them? How can we learn from the, each other's mistakes? And just like those XPRIZE folks, build a community. Build a community of solvers that are better together. So March 1st through 5th, Govapalooza. You can just Google Govapalooza. I'm pretty sure it'll come up at this point, uh, but it's transformgov.org slash govapalooza for, for more information. It, we are going to have thousands of local government leaders there. It's going to be a, a historic event. I don't think there's going to be another Govapalooza coming up on Google, so I think that's that's a pretty safe bet. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a great name. Um, yeah, and so we sort of end where we began, right? We began with aspiration and inspiration, and that's what you're going back to right here for this event. And it's, yeah, we are we are in the winter and we're looking forward to a better spring. We are. Joel, I wanna thank you for spending some time talking about something that we both care about so much. And of course we are looking forward very much to taking part in Palooza. So best of luck with that and all your endeavors. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for listening to this episode of The Intelligent Community. To view prior conversations, go to intelligentcommunity.org slash podcast or check us out on Spotify or Apple. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at New Communities, that's plural, New Communities, or on LinkedIn and Facebook by searching for Intelligent Community Forum. 
Next up on our calendar is the Smart 21 Conference from Surviving to Thriving, which takes place online from February 22nd to 24th. It's produced by two communities in the greater Vancouver area in British Columbia, uh, Canada, the township of Langley and the city of Maple Ridge. And it is where ICF will announce its Smart 21 communities of 2021. You can find out more at icfsmart21.com. That's icfsmart21.com. For ICF, this is Robert Bell.